Hello, my name is John Clark, and I would like to welcome you to UCTV's four part television series entitled Global Warming Change Begins with Learning. This series is co sponsored by UCSB's Donald Brand School of Environmental Science and Management and the Community Environmental Council in Santa Barbara. In other episodes, we'll be addressing a number of climate change issues, including the ecological impacts of climate change, uh, policy implications, and the link between climate change and water supply. But today, we're talking about resource productivity, and I would like to introduce our guests in the studio. Today, we have Dr. Ernst, I'll get this right, von Weisecker, did I do that well? And Dr. Roland Gare. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming today. Perhaps we could start off by allowing you two to in introduce yourselves, do a better job than I did, talk a little bit about your role at the Bren School and perhaps some of the research that you do there. Who'd like to start? Roland, why don't you? <laughs> okay, why not? Okay. Um, well, John, I am at the Bren School for just over three years now and uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, I'm actually a physicist by training. I did a postgraduate degree in physics at the, in Berlin Technical University and uh, then I had a brief stint at a business school in France, an American type business school called INSEAD and this is where I started to work on environmental issues in mm -hmm. particular remanufacturing, the economics of remanufacturing obviously being at a business school economics and the profitability of these things is matters is very important but also the the environmental benefits remanufacturing meaning that you do not destroy things after use but you make use of existing parts for reassembly it it could be the the parts of a, a product that reach the end of its use phase or it could be virtually the entire product just to give you a, a small idea, um, Bosch Power Tools is very interested in that idea and they actually did measurements of how much uh, power tools are being used um, by households and uh, the, it turned out that the average use time of a power tool uh, is seven minutes of its total life so you can see that this is virtually a new product and uh, with a little bit of of disassembly and polishing and cleaning, uh, you have a, a brand new product there mm -hmm. for reuse. Terrific. So that's, that's the idea of remanufacturing. So that's profitable and also ecologically benign. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of, since this subject is, uh, is climate change, in terms of energy consumption or CO2 emissions, which is kind of the other side of energy consumption, uh, you might easily get savings of a factor four or five with, by remanufacturing. Actually, that is essentially my kind of agenda. Looking at global warming, the question is, what can you, can you best do? Mm -hmm. And some say nuclear, some say renewables, biofuels and all that. And I say efficiency. Mm -hmm. We can do a lot better, like in the manufacturing example. We can do five times better, for instance. And, and we're going to be talking a lot about that, but I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself, because yeah. you haven't done okay. that, that, Dean Weisseker. I have been changing jobs every now and then. During the last couple of years, I was chairman of the German Parliament's Environment Committee, allowing me to oversee some of the emissions trading introduced into Germany at the time. And before that, I was president of the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy, where we sort of launched the resource productivity agenda. Uh, it has become a major theme in Asia, in Japan, in China and other countries. And now I'm very happy being here at the University of California in Santa Barbara at the Donald Bren School as the Dean, trying to give some steering guidance and learning from others here. It's a fantastic campus. We have earth sciences, climate sciences, we have the marine sciences, life sciences and others. So uh, this is a wonderful environment. And then we also have a first-class engineering school. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the energy efficiency or broader resource productivity agenda cannot be done without engineers. Maybe you'd want to talk a little bit about how the school as a whole is addressing the climate change issue and then finish that up with why you decided to be a co-sponsor of this television series. I wouldn't say the Donald Brent School has been a strong player in climate change in the past, 
We have a fantastic uh, professor of climate economics, Charlie Kolstad. He is also a lead author at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And with Professor Oren Young, we have the international governance dimension of it. Professor John Milak, who is also the associate dean, looks at the uh, biosphere-atmosphere interactions. So we have many good science bits, but not yet something like an integrated uh, climate research. But for that, of course, the natural sciences, including Professor David Lee and others, are just more um, equipped, more qualified. We do more on the policy side. And then, of course, it becomes more and more an important part of education for environmental science and management. Mm -hmm. And so you're linking between your school and the other departments at UCSB to link yes. the research and the management policy well, side. Generally, you would say environmental science and management lends itself to close cooperation with other departments. Terrific. And when we are this time talking about resource productivity, I believe the most important thing is with engineering. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should just uh, check in there, talking about engineering opportunities for uh, uh, cooperation, collaboration. Uh, I just uh, started two research projects, very fascinating research pro projects in my area, reuse and recycling. And one is about uh, designing computer chips for reuse. So obviously, same again. Computer chips, mm -hmm. when they reach, when the computer reaches the end of, of its life, typically three years or less, the computer chip is nowhere near the end of its life itself. It could run for four or five times as long. Um, but there are some issues with, with uh, reusability and actually designing chips to be microchips to be reused would be a tremendous step forward. And again, the amount of, of energy and, and, and greenhouse gas savings are easily, again, in the, in the range of factor four, factor five. Terrific. And so we actually have a collaboration with computer scientists, with actual um, chip designers, chip architects, in order to make that happen. Well, we'll want to talk about some computer recycling later because it's its, a, it's a own story in itself. Um, I want to introduce the Community Environmental Council. It's the other co-sponsor of this. Uh, I'm on the board. My day job is uh, executive director of the James S. Bauer Foundation, but on the board of the Community Environmental Council of Santa Barbara. Uh, we have a program, basically our, all of our work right now is related to climate change and energy use. It's called Fossil Free. And uh, for folks that want to find out more about that, that's Fossil Free 30. Uh, it's the website is cecsb.org and the program is Fossil Free by 33. Let's take a step back a little bit. We're going to talk specifically about the work you two do uh, in just a second, but maybe for the audience, uh, one or both of you could just define the term resource productivity. What as a broad term, what are we talking about? It's fairly simple. Doing more with less. A factor of four would mean we would be able to double wealth while at the same time cutting resource use in half. So for instance, if you can do agricultural irrigation with only one quarter of the water needed by drip irrigation, then the water productivity is increasing fourfold, which of course is very good news for dry areas. If you recycle and reuse materials, including in particular metals, then you can increase the material productivity fourfold, tenfold even. And for climate science, I believe the most important part is energy productivity. For instance, here at the campus we have Professor Shuji Nakamura who is doing solid state lighting, sometimes called LED, light electric diodes, which extract some eight to ten times more light intensity from one kilowatt hour. Mm. So that is fantastic. You can have a light good light environment and at the same time reduce your bill on electricity. Mm -hmm. Or you can do cars that do 100 up to 150 miles a gallon instead of a mere 20 or 30, which is a factor of four easily. And that would solve much more 
of uh, the US problem with regard to oil dependency than all biofuels taken together. So, uh, you know, factor four, I mean, it sounds, without a definition, it sounds a little bit like either a hair care product or, you know, a comic book heroes, but it's not, of course, and I understand that you had something to do with that or you were involved in the idea of factor four. Could you talk about the genesis of that and why not factor five, why not factor three? Could you talk about how that, that came to be? A friend of mine said a factor of 10. And then I said, well, that's a bit outlandish. And in some cases, you really bump into the laws of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, which is... You don't uh, want to bump into those laws. No, no. no. So better be on the cautious side. Mm -hmm. And a factor of four, I mean, it's caricature, I fully admit. But if you can say doubling wealth while halving resource use, that is good news for all countries, in particular for the developing countries. They do need more wealth. There is no question about that. And in a sense, so do the poor in, in the rich countries. So uh, doubling wealth is a good political statement. And cutting resource use in half is more or less the order of magnitude that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change asks us to do in terms of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. So can Cut you them in half and then we are in a much better shape. Can you talk about applying factor four in a, in a developing world situation? Give us some examples of how that plays out. Absolutely. The Chinese are actually doing that. Over the last 15 years or so, they have been uh, increasing energy efficiency at least twofold and in their 11th five-year plan adopted last year they committed themselves to do another doubling within 15 years or so that would be a factor four then and uh, it's all kinds of things from doing away with the village size steel manufacturing, which was a crazy idea of the Gang of Four, mm -hmm. uh, which was extremely inefficient regarding energy. And they have done away with that and uh, somewhat larger units and definitely much more energy efficient. Um, two, lighting. I believe China is the biggest um, manufacturer of uh, efficient lamps, lighting, mm -hmm. so, of the world. They could export that to agriculture, to housing, you know, air conditioners are extremely inefficient and you can do much better there. And uh, you can build houses that, that are essentially energy self-sufficient. My friend Amory Lovins in Snowmass, Colorado has uh, such a house, the Rocky Mountain Institute, mm -hmm. which is famous for being so extremely energy efficient. Uh, Professor Guy, I'm going to get to you about recycling stuff in just a second. I have one more factor four question, though. And in, in given China and India and the, and the tremendous economic growth that they have in their future to raise their standard of living in their country and, and a lot of the developing world, is factor four enough given the amount of growth that uh, those economies see in their future? I'm sure it's not. Actually, when I'm traveling to Japan and see my friends there, I see them patting on my shoulder and say, it's nice of you to talk about the factor of four. I mean, mm -hmm. we aim at the factor of 10 because, you know, mm -hmm. factor four is ridiculous. So uh, I believe they sense that the Asian dynamics will ask for much more ambitious goals. But here in the West, I think it is wiser to be on the modest side. But the factor four is still quite a mouthful of a promise. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, increasing energy efficiency by 300%, this is a factor of four. This is quite a transition for our entire economy. Well, it's certainly a, a far step beyond some of the policy statements you've heard from this administration and even in this state of 20% improvement in efficiency yeah. or 30%, which is a far away from factor four, certainly. Right. Uh, Professor Geyer, let's yes. hear a little bit about your research, and, and, and I'm going to grill you a little bit about computer recycling later, but maybe just inter introduce some of your work and, and talk about that. Yeah, maybe just to, so maybe some of you wonder by now, you know, why is someone working on reuse and recycling 
talking about climate change. Well, well, I was wondering when I <laughs> saw it. <that laughs> right. You, and uh, interviewees, sure. And for, for me, actually, first of all, resource productivity, incre increasing resource productivity for me very often is, um, is, is just increasing energy and efficiency and thus reducing greenhouse gas emissions in disguise. And, uh, and I, I know that it seems in California that very often reuse and recycling is being discussed in the context of um, reducing waste, solid waste to landfill. But when you actually look at the big picture, the, the big environmental benefits from most reuse and recycling activities are actually a massively increased energy and, and materials efficiency. And just to, to rehabilitate um, people talking about factor 10 uh, or more, um, recycling aluminum is a, a classic example. If you make aluminum from, from scrap rather than from primary materials, um, you will reduce the CO2 emissions right there by a factor 20. Mm. So a uh, beverage can recycling is, is not really about keeping beverage can out of landfill. It's about, it's about uh, fighting climate change, believe it or not. And, and where in your experience, I, I, I actually, Community Environmental Council's sort of first iteration was about recycling and, and waste management, and some of the discussion was, uh, particularly from critics, were saying, well, recycling aluminum, boy, that makes sense, economic sense. But some of the things involved in the law, the, the law here in the state of California, AB 939, didn't make sense. So uh, where, where the policy push was getting the marketplace and the technology to do things uh, that, that might have not other made sense without that policy push. So are there some areas where you're seeing that, boy, recycling really does make sense or reuse really does make sense and other areas where you're saying, no, you know that recycling that plastic bottle or, or doing that with this industrial process is, is not what we should be promoting. Are there some areas where it does work and doesn't? Uh, absolutely, John. Um, in, um, with recycling, certainly you can't, you, you shouldn't do recycling just because recycling must be good for the environment. Um, you should look at the, the, the actual situation and at, at the numbers and uh, in the case of metals it's practically almost a good idea the the environmental benefits especially in terms of greenhouse gas savings out of recycling aluminum steel copper virtually all the metals are tremendous um, with other materials it's it, it, it really depends. And one of the things that I'm especially interested in in my research is what I call um, product displacement. And uh, that essentially um, takes account of the fact that these enormous benefits of recycling, you really only harvest if you make sure that your recycled material displaces primary production. Mm. So that essentially means that you, you don't just collect things and reprocess them and then you have say a lot of regranulate plastics and you don't know what to do with it because no one wants it and then you turn it into bark benches right. and, and litter parks. At with that it. point it's not really recycling, it's a sort of I mean in a way it's disposal. It's in kind a of parking form. them. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. So if so really if you want to har to harness the so say the climate change potential of recycling and reuse activities, what you have to ensure is that there is displacement that uh, by recycling increasing amounts of materials and reusing increasing numbers of products, we have less and less primary production of these materials or of products. And then you really have I an enormous impact. I believe we can impact. say in a simplified manner that there are two different approaches to um, mitigating global warming by waste management. One is what Roland says, replacing uh, natural resources such as bauxite or uh, uh, other ores. And the other is the um, biomass. Mm -hmm. If you um, landfill biomass, you're creating a lot of methane, which is actually a much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So avoiding that is also important or at least capture that met methane that is emitted and burn it. Mm -hmm. So replacing fossil fuels by methane from waste dumps mm -hmm. has double uh, good effect on mitigating global warming. And uh, energy cascades are another way of um, 
depicting that. You know, energy can you, comes can you describe into an the energy system. cascade for us? Um, for instance, uh, a power plant produces electricity, but then a combined heat and power system makes use of the waste heat, which mm -hmm. is not actually waste. It can be used for process, uh, chemical processes, or for heating buildings, or for uh, other energy intensive processes. And then when energy flows out of houses or uh, wherever, it can still heat, uh, you know, greenhouses for uh, plants, etc. So energy cascades. And, yes. and right now, particularly on a, on a not, I understand on an industrial scale, in many cases, co-generation where you're using the industrial heat is being used, but on a residential scale or Maybe. on an office building scale, Maybe. we don't, we don't even touch that in, in our culture. Uh, not at and, all. And so, why, so why not? What, what needs to be done to start to address this? this secondary capture that you talked about? Well, maybe I should just showcase um, one project that we're currently uh, working on in, uh, at the Brain School, again with engineering, and it takes exactly the idea of cascading energy use, so we actually call it energy recycling, um, as on an industrial scale it, it, is, it is largely used like combined heat and power, also combined cycle power plants um, where you first have the fuel go through a gas turbine and then the, the, the exhaust, the very hot exhaust, drive a steam turbine, you get enormous efficiencies. And the same kind of recycling energy idea you, you can use in, in uh, building houses. And one of our projects is uh, about the heat, re heat recycling from air conditioners, essentially. And it's, uh, I, I love the idea and it's essentially if think about that, uh, about 45% of the peak electricity demand in California is driven by air conditioning. So if, if we have rolling blackouts, this is essentially due to air conditioning. And air conditioning is essentially a heat mover. It removes the heat from inside the house and just moves it to the outside and generates an enormous amount of heat, which just then tries to dissipate into the hot summer mm -hmm. air. Um, at the same time, um, we have... Um, uh, we, we, we use hot water in the house, which is typically created by, by burning natural gas in order to heat the water. So our idea is to recycle the waste heat of the air conditioner and direct it straight to the, the hot water tank and heat the hot water with this waste heat. Well, I, I wanted to talk about this later, but we'll just jump into it now. I mean, that's a fine theoretical technological fix. In, in, but my house doesn't have it, and in, in my next house might not have it. What's it going to take? To moving it from an idea that exists at the Bren School to to being a demonstrated project to being standard fare. Well, talk talk to us about how we go from you know having it in in your office into everyone's. What what what's that going to take? Yeah, you you're of course right. I mean, I, I sound a little bit like a techno fixer now, and uh, I don't want to portray. Well, that's okay. As long as you can continue <laughs> with the conversation, that's great. But um, so I just think it is a great technology, and we are currently working on the proof of concept in theory and then ideally with the California Energy Commission and then, and then building a prototype and showing that it, that it works and that what we think the potential is, is actually realized in the prototype. But the big question again, and, and you, you, you put the, uh, your finger uh, right on it, is um, how do you move, how do you deploy that? How do you, how do you get a mass diffusion of technologies like this? And I'm afraid there is no easy, there is no easy answer to that. Well, the Europeans do that. In Sweden, they have building codes who don't get permits mm -hmm. for a building unless it meets certain energy standards. So, so a very strong regulatory very, hand is a push. Very strong, mm -hmm. and it doesn't make uh, the Swedes unhappy, mm -hmm. and it ma makes the country richer. So that's one way of doing it. The <coughs> Japanese have introduced an interesting system which they call the top runner program. A top runner in one category, let's say refrigerators, is the one um, brand that is most energy efficient. And the government and industry jointly declare this the top runner. And then there is a rule that all the competi competitors offering the same kind of um, appliances 
have to meet the standards of the top runner uh, in a couple of years. Otherwise, they get an admonishment by the uh, government, which is the most embarrassing thing to get in, uh, in Japan, in mm -hmm. the Japanese culture. So they hasten up. And uh, eventually, they even get a fine. And uh, this they do for an increasing number of uh, categories, including uh, motor vehicles, etc. And this has helped more or less double the electricity and um, fuel efficiency of the, Americ uh, of the Japanese uh, household appliances and vehicles. Well, in, in, uh, in our country, we don't embarrass as easily or for nearly as long, in my experience. And, and, and let's talk about this sort of policy business interface, since it was one of the things we were going to at least talk about later. Uh, in my experience in the 90s, at least in this country, uh, after, after Earth Day, there was a, there was a <coughs> tremendous environmental awareness. And most companies ended up hiring or getting a vice president of environmental something. And, and during press conferences, that they'd be kind of pushed out in front to talk about environmental issues. But over time, um, you know, once once this vice president of environmental something had gotten the company to copy papers on both sides and you know put a recycling thing in everyone's cubicle, a lot of those programs got sidelined and 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 it became a very depressing job for people because they were not as the main part of of what the company did and, and they ended up in many cases actually literally in the back of the warehouse and, and they would grab them by the collar and put them out when there was a problem but when it came to running the day-to-day -day business they really didn't have much of an impact and, and that whole thing faded away for a little bit. Do you see with climate change, is it, is it dif different this time in the companies you are working with? Is, is, are these issues becoming more to the fore, or is this just another kind of corporate greening, and when the public stops paying attention, that they'll just be asked to go back to the warehouse again? Is it, is it different now? In, well, in, in my experience with working with you know, a variety of companies from, from a variety of, of sectors, um, I almost personally came to the conclusion that um, and especially in the US, it might actually be some forward-thinking companies that are driving the, the agenda. And, and you are you're absolutely right, back in the 90s, when I got into the environmental uh, arena professionally, the 90s I call the, the decade of the green consumer. And there were a, enormous excitement about this idea of having environmentally preferable product and, and customers choosing these products based on their environmental performance and uh, there's been quite a, a sobering uh, since then and, and lots of people are asking where, where, the, where the green consumer went and mm -hmm. if he just disappeared or, or what happened. So currently um, the, the driving force that I see is, is in, in many forward-thinking companies and, and sometimes it even seems like they would, they would like to push things further if they were sure that the, the customers would follow. And is that, is that a CEO leadership or all throughout the company? Where are you seeing that? And, and yes. then do you agree? But, well, basically, yes. Uh, let me make a number of distinctions. One is environmentalism of the 1970s versus the kind of question you are asking now. In the 70s, we had the convenience of the environmental damage being uh, next to you, visible. Everybody knew. And then action was relatively easy. You knew what to do to improve your own environment. And with climate, much of the effects are in the future, in 2050, and worldwide, not easily localized. So the awareness is a different ball game from what it was 30 years ago. But as Roland rightly says, some leading companies do take on that challenge, not least GE or Walmart and a few others, uh, who think this is going to be profitable, even if it is not now, it will be, partly because Pro profitable of Profitable from, from a, from a, because they're going to be able to charge more like organic produce, or profitable because it's well, a, an, efficient, one, an efficiency thing within the production process? Part, where, where do they see the money? I believe that the green consumer is one part. This is mostly referred to for consumers in this country. But uh, in a globalized world, the consumers in China 
or in Japan or in Holland or so count just as well. Mm -hmm. And there you see a lot more um, climate conscious consumers, notably actually in Britain. In Britain this is the top point on the hmm. uh, public agenda nowadays. So this is one part. But in addition to that, we see certain countries, I mentioned Japan, but also China, um, raising the standards for energy efficiency. And it would be just deadly for Whirlpool not to be able to compete with Matsushita in Japan for lack of energy efficiency. Because that would then destroy their competitiveness on world markets. So Whirlpool has to be just as alert as General Motors and, has. And, and are they, or, or are they making the Japanese Whirlpool and that's going to be better, and then the Kansas United States Whirlpool and that's going to be well, clunkier? Will, I mean, what what do you see? differ from company to company. Well, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I should just say a, a little bit uh, about that. Um, so just to step back one minute, and I think what your original question, you know, what, what drives these, co these companies, I think it's typically it's the the triad of um, a, an aware customer that does have a real preference, um, cost savings potential, like real and significant cost savings potential, like um, internal remanufacturing. There's the well documented, over almost documented case mm -hmm. of Xerox remanufacturing operations and the tremendous cost and energy savings that came from this program. And also uh, anticipating legislation, like, like Ernst said. And in terms of legislation, um, with globally operating companies, um, you typically, in, in my experience, what you find is that they don't like to have 50 different standards for di 50 different markets. Le they, uh, they like to they say have one standard and, and, and apply it to, to all the markets. So typically what you see in these big multinational companies is that the strictest standard, environmental standard, they have to, um, they have to adopt for whatever reason, say, because it, it's a legislation that's in, in the European and, Union. And they tend to ap apply it and does Globally. it have to be, I mean, if, it, if it's the, uh, a stricter, stricter standard in Sussex County, England, that may not get their attention, but if it's a stricter standard in California or the whole oh, of Britain, how big does that stricter standard have to be before a, well, a multinational company goes, well, okay, we have to adapt to that? I mean, uh, what I can say is that uh, the European Union as a market is certainly big enough. And, and, big. and these, these days, um, a lot of environmental uh, uh, regulation is done on a on a European le level, at least on f you know the, the the frameworks of the legislation, and then individuals they get implemented maybe slightly differently. Um, but um, legislation like the waste electrical electronic equipment directive in the EU um, is of such an impact that uh, every electronics company I know in the US basically wants to change their operations globally in order to comply with this, with this legislation. But there is scope for a government or international intervention into markets, like in the wake of the Kyoto Protocol, the European Union have introduced a emissions trading system and thus that has led the corporate sector to move into avoiding carbon emissions because if they had a permit that they didn't use, they could sell it, which is cash. Mm -hmm. And if they were um, doing too much of emissions, they had to buy, which is negative cash. So emissions trading is one way and are you seeing that also in the U.S.? I mean, I know it's a pretty vibrant market in the EU. Can you, you both have tremendous international experience. Could you maybe, f for our U.S. audience, talk about some of the, the differences logic you see in that, of in that the area? The Californian AB32 is also a cap mm -hmm. for um, greenhouse gases and then trading under the cap. 
a cap and trade. Mm -hmm. This is the, the system which have, uh, has been introduced in Europe. And that seems to be flying also in America. It's the most market-oriented way of doing it. And it helps modernize the industry. I believe that another instrument is coming to the fore, also I believe from Europe, but also Japan. This is an ecological tax reform reducing taxes on human labor and increasing taxes on natural resources, in particular and so energy. Politically, you think that really has a chance to fly? In Europe, it's kind of commonplace. There mm -hmm. is a European directive on energy taxes, which is relatively modest. Nevertheless, in the Scandinavian countries, in Germany, in Britain, etc., they have uh, fairly hefty energy taxes and were thereby able to reduce the indirect labor costs. So the scarce factor energy got dearer and the not so scarce factor human labor got cheaper, which is good in terms mm -hmm. of allocation of uh, resources. So where do you see that impetus happening in this country because you know you touch the tax code or you even talking about carbon tax in the United well, States. Thomas it's, Friedman it's a short conversation. It, uh, all the time. He's and, a very smart uh, guy and a good writer so but politically speaking wh where do you see that? It will take some time until mm -hmm. th what is good for the country becomes also good for politicians. Mm -hmm. This is not now the case. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we were, you touched upon computer chip recycling, and uh, hopefully this doesn't take us away too far from our topic, but right now uh, in California there's a new law that basically if, you, if it plugs in it, it can't go in the trash, and, and so there's a recycling system being set up around electronics, and then you look a little deeper or read further and you look at some of the uh, recycling, where that really goes. It's, it's, well, not, yes. it's not disassembled by you know, pixie dust or fairies, it goes somewhere, it's generally China or India, and the conditions are horrible. I mean, I mean, we're they, exporting they an indeed. environmental problem just from our neighborhood to someone else. Oh, and, yes. and how does that, how does that kind of uh, environmental equity fit into the systems that you're talking about? What changes would we want to see? Because that, it's hard to see that the system we have now for electronics, particularly, as being very sound or just. The yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And the where you where you draw your your system boundaries of what kind of environmental impacts and where they occur you're interested in is, is, is critical in coming up with, with good solutions. And um, one of the things that, that I'm, I am looking at is this potential for simply exporting pollution. And then, but especially in terms of climate change, you can't export it because it doesn't really matter where, where the, the emissions occur, it's, it's, it's all global, it's a global phenomenon. So, so there we really need to um, you know, think beyond national boundaries and, and, and all pull together. Um, in in uh, terms of, of e-waste recycling, I think much of, again, much of the um, recycling activities and legislation uh, in California or, or nationwide is, is based on the, f on, on the fear of uh, the leaching of toxic uh, uh, substances in landfills, which, which is justified. I don't want to uh, uh, um, talk this away. There, there is a real concern that things like, like lead and chromium and cadmium can, can leach out of landfills and do significant damage. But when you actually look at the the total system, what we call the life cycle of the whole product, and um, then recycling can often make things worse, actually. And if you, if you just uh, ship all this e-waste to countries like India or China and recycle them, uh, which is basically just very simple, basic manual recovery of some of the copper cables uh, and, and just open fires where they burn off the the plastics, uh, mantles of the copper cables. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that in overall environmental terms, you've made things a lot worse. And so how does your chip reuse or chip recycling that you were talking about fit within the system? Does the system need to change to adapt for you know, the technologies you're talking about, or, or is it is it going to dovetail in? Well, the, um, the, the beauty of reuse is that the the um, operations that you need in order to make reuse happen are typically extremely benign. They typically consist of disassembly, cleaning, 
testing and reassembly. So th this is just one of the reasons why reuse is, is just so much more elegant and so much more powerful than typically recycling. Recycling processes can be fairly dirty and you, you need state-of-the-art, best available technology to make sure that recycling doesn't make things worse. With, with reuse it's, it's very different. You can have tremendous material and energy savings uh, without, without any, any drawbacks, really. I even heard in Europe they were talking about either through the marketplace or through legislation talking about a reused car or where large chunks of an automobile would be reused instead of recycled. Is that, is that true? Have you heard about this? I hope I'm not the first person to hear about it. it is, is that the case for some of the, some of the places? Indeed, there is the idea of the company's responsibility for its products throughout the lifetime of the product and they have to take it back mm. and then uh, they are before the question of either uh, shreddering it or remanufacturing it and then they discover as Roland suggests that remanufacturing is actually profitable. Mm. And is that starting to happen or is it some of this? It's starting to happen, yes indeed. Very interesting. And I know in, in Germany they had, uh, from the recycling days, the, I think it was the, the green point system where if you made packaging, you either had to make sure it was taken care of or you had to take it back. And, and the right. companies, the manufacturing companies said, well, we don't want it all back, but we're going to oversee and set up a recycling system that takes care of it for us. Do you see the same kind of system, reuse, recycling system happen with other industries or are companies going to take it back? I believe the next big advance in this regard will be electronic waste. We have a fairly strict electronic waste directive which is now being implemented in all European member countries, 27 member countries, and uh, that is really profitable if you do it well. Of course you have to ask the designers of electronics to have a remanufacturing friendly design so that the disassembly leads then to relatively easy reassembly. Mm -hmm. in, in, terms of, in terms of climate change, I know at CEC uh, we've been working on our fossil free program and, and it's, it's such a big issue. And we got this menu list about a mile long of all the things we could do. And then we went through the exercise of, well, given the fact that we're a small group in Santa Barbara and we really need to focus, what are the half a dozen things that we've got to do to make a difference? Because we're not going to get to everything. So in terms of resource productivity and the technologies you're seeing, what, what are, can you give us a couple of examples of some areas that are really going to make a big difference? I mean, there, there are a bunch of things going to make a small difference, but where do you see real bang for the buck in this area? Where, where we're going to see real movement towards improving climate change. What are those areas? Well, I must not admit the, miss the opportunity of applauding the CEC, the Community Environmental Council, for this Carbon Free by 33. This is a great thing that you do, and you involve your members and uh, interact with academia, etc. This is really great. And the best bang for the buck, I believe, is first in lighting. The old incandescent light bulbs are simply dinosaurs and will have to be replaced, and that's profitable. Um, the next one will be refurbishing old homes, mm -hmm. which are not energy efficient in terms of um, air conditioning, and, well, here in California, it's not so much the heating question, uh, that's more a Montana uh, kind mm -hmm. of question, but nevertheless, uh, it's also there. It's been cold. Yes, <laughs> insulation uh, is a very good thing, and making a second use of energy, as Roland suggests, is also very important. You can use the outflowing heat for heating the inflowing fresh air. Uh, again, mm -hmm. for cold climates this is more important. But similarly, you can make use of the outflowing heat uh, from air conditioners for water, as you have suggested. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this whole heat management mm -hmm. is profitable uh, if you think a little long term. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, houses have to be refurbished right. every 20 years or so. And if you have to do it anyway, then why not do it with a, with a view of reducing energy costs? Mm -hmm. That's very good. And then uh, I believe the third very important thing that will take another 20 years altogether is a new car fleet with a doubled mileage mm -hmm. per gallon. I believe this is absolutely doable. That is also quite a challenge for Detroit, but they seem to understand it now, finally. Mm -hmm. Professor Guy, or anything you'd want to add to that list of three? Well, maybe just all I can do is, is, is really summarize it. Um, what I truly believe is that the, um, if, if we want to curb climate change and not just try you know, to, to geoengineer things like things I read about, like you know, putting millions of little mirrors into the stratosphere and things I'm, I'm really, really worried about, because mm -hmm. um, once they're out there, they're there. There's nothing, we can't collect them back. I, I, th I think essentially what we have to do, there is no silver bullet in terms of uh, energy that doesn't have any greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we, what, we, what we really need is, is, a, is an efficiency revolution, just an energy efficiency revolution. And I hope um, that Ernst and I sort of were able to, to show that there is enormous potential um, because there is still is just enormous waste and basically, whenever you address the, the energy waste issue, you, um, you, you increase wealth by reducing resource consumption and you reduce um, greenhouse gases all at the same time. Uh, and very often, not at all to the ex expense of you know, the, the consumer. Just with I'd like to put that into a somewhat more philosophical language. Um, over the last 200 years, the Industrial Revolution, what we have seen in this world, and America has done a great job in that, has been the increase of labor productivity. I believe it has increased 20-fold easily. And this is the basis of our wealth. Uh, so out of one hour of human labor, we extract 20 times as much wealth. And this is why we have high wages, etc. Now. Nowadays, labor is not in short supply. Uh, the International Labor Office uh, talks about a lack of 800 million jobs. We have so much unemployment, essentially. Mm -hmm. The real scarce thing is nature, or resources for that matter. So if we manage, during the next 200 years, making a big step during the next 30 years and increasing resource productivity 20-fold. And let's talk about quadrupling it in the next 30 years. That is absolutely doable. Mm -hmm. Then we have the second industrial revolution, and this time to the benefit of the environment. So we're going to talk about policy issues in a, in a later episode, but let's just pretend here you've got a meeting with our new, uh, you know, new head of the House or, or the, the head of the Assembly in the state of California, and you've got just you know, a couple minutes, and you're going to say, look, for resource productivity from a legislative side, these are a couple, two or three things that you really got to do, and, and it's going to make a difference. Do you have a short list for, for, a, for a legislator or a politician that, you know, in the cocktail party, do this, this, and this, that you would say these are absolutes? I believe education and awareness building is first, yeah, because that also gives the public support for anything that may be kind of unexpected, unusual, such as energy taxes. But an ecological tax reform might be a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. It should be slowly, so that you don't have any shocks or capital destruction. But if you know, like in human labor, that costs will go up decade after decade, then you will see invest investors' money flowing in the direction of energy efficiency, because it's profitable. And then certain standards can be set, like fuel standards, including certain biofuels, and uh, better efficiency standards, that should rather be a nationwide thing and not net California alone. But I believe um, sta the standard setting agenda 
is something uh, America can easily uh, can do just as well as the Europeans do. Professor Guy, or anything to add or change on that list? Well, maybe just to you always have to go second. I don't know how it worked out that way. Compliment that. That is quite all right. That, that <laughs> reflects our seniority. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say that when I when I started in the uh, environmental arena, uh, the Wuppertal Institute in Germany, and and therefore of course Ernst, uh, were they were my my shining examples mm. of of how to do things properly. Um, I, I see tremendous um, potential for carbon trading. Uh, in, in the US, it's, it's, it's an economic mechanism, so I think it, it won't be such a difficult sell as, as taxes, as, as you mentioned. Uh, I do think um, the US should revisit cafe standards. It, 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 it's can it be given. that difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. to raise cafe standards? And, and, there, and I think there's tremendous economic potential in the you know, technological ingenuity that would be unleashed by just by raising these standards. And you see that already with hybrid electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, and so on. And, and again, maybe education, I see well, one, one of the things I, I love about this country is, is its sense of can do, this spirit of can do and, and enthusiasm, this, this potential for enthusiasm. So if, if we would manage to, to have a, a mass movement of embracing energy efficiency. If energy efficiency becomes the new horsepower, right? If 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 the if the guys in the pub brag about the the miles per gallon they get mm -hmm. rather than the horsepower they have in their cars, I think that would go a long way towards towards solving this problem. That hasn't happened in my pub yet, but we'll <laughs> try to see if we can get the conversation started. And maybe I, maybe I won't get thrown out. Um, both of you have tremendous international experience and, and, and now you're here in this country doing your work and, and combined with that I know we're, we're running short of time but I really would if each of you could give a snippet of, of what can the United States learn from other countries based on what you've seen internationally what, what are the three or four things that uh, you know if, if you could see the US pick up XYZ this is what they'd be what what would that be you want to go first this time okay why not <laughs> well first a qualifier I mean I've 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 traveled a little bit in the US but I still feel like the only place I I, I started to know is California so I'm 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 more qualified to that, talk about California that, that than works. anything sure it's anything else state. and and there I really would have to say um, that you know there are countries in in Europe that sort of think of themselves as sort of environmental leaders and now after three years of living in California I think there is there are California is doing extremely well um, in in tackling environmental issues and uh, so I don't I don't think California has to learn from other countries that are doing so much better I think the two things that I would, I would hope maybe uh, can change in the, in the future is again the, and I think we, California had that already maybe t 10, 20 years ago, is energy efficiency and the value of it, um, and that tax is not something horrible. Oh, if great. it's spent the right way. Well, Dean, unfortunately, you don't get to answer that question because I know we're out of time, um, but, but everyone else speaking works for you, so you can take one of their places if you'd like. We'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to UCTV's uh, Global Warming Change Begins with Learning, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. <laughs>